and welcome to yet another extremely timely and riveting AMET webinar. July 1st, today, was supposed to have been D-Day, Decision Day, about the extension of Israeli sovereignty over certain communities in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. Um, well, at least in terms of Israel time, July 1st has come and gone. Many of us have been waiting since 1967 for the state of Israel to be able to have something that nearly every other state has, clearly defined and defensible borders. There's an old English adage, he who hesitates is lost. Right after the 1967 war, maybe for a brief nanosecond in terms of historical time, the state of Israel was adored among the community of nations. However, in the 53 years hence, the Palestinian cause has replaced that of the plucky, defiant, outnumbered little Jewish state in the adoring eyes of many in the West. Which brings me to yet another aphorism. Opportunities are never lost. They are just taken by others. We're fully cognizant, however, that this is an extremely controversial decision and that there are many factors that the government of Israel has had to weigh carefully before making a sovereignty move. Here to speak about why this move is so critically important for the state of Israel and the United States and the West is David Wormser. And here to tell us a little bit more about what's been going on behind the scenes to put the brakes on this move is Alex Trayman. David Wormser is an old and very dear personal friend um, he is currently the director of the Project on Global Antisemitism and the U.S.-Israeli Relationship for the Center for Security Policy. He has over 35 years of experience in foreign policy with the State Department, Department of Defense, the National Security Council, and the American Enterprise Institute. He is well, he's a well-known expert on Middle East issues, especially in the U.S.-Israeli relationship. He had worked um, from December 2018 to September 2019 as a senior advisor to U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton and was um, credited with authoring a series of memoranda for the White House for striking hard at the Iranian Quds Force and targeted, targeting Qassam Soleimani. Thank you very much for that, David. David also served as a Middle East advisor for Vice President Dick Cheney from 2003 to 2007, among other things. And many of you who have been in attendance during these AMET webinars throughout the days of the pandemic and the subsequent quarantine have grown to know and appreciate the wisdom and the up to the minute behind the scenes knowledge of Alex Trayman. Alex Trayman is also a dear friend to AMET he is the Managing Director and Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS.org. Alice has had his finger in the pulse of everything that's happening in Israel and within the Israeli Knesset. He has written scores of articles and has directed and produced major films, um, such as the critically acclaimed Iranian and Honor Diaries. Without further ado, we'll begin with David Wormser, who will talk about the importance of this move. David? Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Annette, as an organization <clears throat> for being so on the out front and, and um, really carrying the water for everybody. So I really appreciate the organization as well as personally everything you've done. We were talking about it earlier for the last 20, 30 years, uh, Sarah. So thank you. Now, on to uh, what is commonly called annexation. And I want to start with that word because I think it gives the importance of it. Um, if, you know, in the Western press, it's annexation, 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 which if you open a dictionary, it's essentially when somebody assumes the territory that does not belong to itself. You have, a, you have an agreement, there's an annex. The annex is not part of the agreement, it's added to it. So annexation is considered, sort of the connotation of it already betrays something. And I think we all know this, it's, it, it goes back to the core why do we call it the West Bank and not Judea and Samaria? Because the word Judea, it's kind of hard to say you can't allow Jews to take back Judea. Uh, we're putting the Judea, Judea back in it. Um, any rate, so the point is, I think we have a very serious issue here, first of all, with terminology, because it's changed the narrative. 
And I think that betrays a larger problem. The larger problem is you have the 67 war, Israel takes the Temple Mount. And since the day Israel took the Temple Mount, I think that it's essentially been on the defensive and it's allowed itself to be whittled away and it's slowly allowed itself to lose control of the situation. It started with the very few minutes of having taken the Temple Mount when Moshe Dayan asked for the flag, the Israeli flag, which had been raised over the Dome of the Rock to be removed. And one can argue the wisdom of such things and so forth, but the problem was that wasn't a one-off. That was the beginning of a trend. The trend essentially wound up in Oslo where the narrative had fundamentally shifted by taking the PLO, bringing them into Israel or into, the, into Judea and Samaria, Gaza, you essentially brought an organization dedicated to the terms of 1948 rather than 1967. This wasn't anymore about self-determination or freedom or human rights for people who lived in the West Bank and Gaza. This now was about the nationalism of the Palestinians as defined through their concept of 1948, which by the way, made it an insoluble problem because 1948 cannot be solved without one or the other side losing completely. And uh, God forbid that would be Israel. So essentially you've seen this constant pattern of withdrawal by Israel from its claims to the West Bank. I think it ma masks an even deeper withdrawal of the West from its obligations to itself. When the mandate, well, when San Remo happened and then the mandate a few years later was agreed upon, it never occurred to anybody to, other, to take Jerusalem and take it away from a Western country. Yes, at that point, there were still a lot of tensions between Jews and Christians and their interests had not yet fully aligned. And as a result, there was a sense of it needed, needs to be internationalized, which Reed is really under the control still of the great Western powers. So, but there was no concept that this territory did not in any way belong to the Jewish people. That was enshrined in the, in the, in the preamble of the mandate where it recognized, not granted, recognized Jewish rights. And again, they didn't want to grant the Jews the right because you can't grant something to somebody who already owns it. So they recognized Jewish ownership. They recognized the deed. And that formed the legal foundation of everything we're dealing with in the territories all the way to the present day. And I think what you're seeing is not only a withdrawal by Israel from its rights over the last 50, 60 years, but the West, from its own foundations over the last hundred years. So the, the fact that they're not only willing to allow Jerusalem or, or to go to a non-Western power, Jerusalem, America is the new Jerusalem in our own concept. So the idea of just writing off Jerusalem, the original Jerusalem, as insignificant uh, is, is a striking um, surrender of, of Western civilization itself. Um, one only has to accompany a Christian or a Jew to Jerusalem and go in the tunnels under the city of David to see the impact and understand how deeply emotive Jerusalem remains for the non, uh, for, 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 the, for the Christian and Jewish worlds. So as a result, I think what you're seeing here is an overall trend toward a breakdown of Western commitment to its own foundations and imposing that breakdown on Israel, which unfortunately was all too eager also to, uh, to accept that breakdown over too many years. So that brings us to the current moment. And it seems to me that to put the annexation in framework, it really, the, the uh, ex application of Israeli law, you see even how easy it is to slip into that. Um, to put it in context, I think it does a number of things. First of all, it takes the, the trend and suddenly stops and reverses it. For the first time, Israel, as well as the major superpower of the Christian world, says, no, some of this territory will never go back. This territory belongs to the Jewish people. And it started with the recognition of Jerusalem and continues now with this. 
it simply draws the line and stops the retreat, both of the West as a whole from its foundations and from in Israel from its own foundations. This has now acquired, I think, a much greater uh, importance because if you look at the riots and what's going on in the United States, we're no longer talking about a racial issue. We're talking about an assault on the foundations of what Western civilization is. Otherwise, why would they uh, destroy the statue of Miguel Cervantes, who never set foot in the West? I mean, regardless of the fact that his statue looks a little bit like, like half-headless Nick in a, in, a, in a Harry Potter series. Uh, but nevertheless, the statue was defaced. And I think it's just one more indication of the fundamental assault on everything and anything that represents the West that is now gripping the West and it's a breakdown. And I think we are really entering a period now where the West is going through an agonizing self re uh, acquaintance or self rediscovery of its own foundations or else, or else it could frankly be lost. Um, and I think when you put the whole framework of the Israeli application of law into Judea and Samaria in that framework, you suddenly begin to realize this is a microcosm of that. And, it, it, it's not only that people were willing to give up Jerusalem or give up the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, they were eager to do it. There was almost a relish to do it. And that really showed how deeply internalized the flight from who we were had become. So I think on a civilizational level, the annexation is critical. I think on a legal level, it's also very important because the legal foundations were, as we were withdrawing civilizationally from commitment to this, we were withdrawing from the law. We were withdrawing from the legal foundations. The mandate established the disposition of the territory. The successor of the mandate, the authority it was uh, the, the British government at the time, the successor of the mandate was the Jewish agency and the, Jew and the Jewish nation, which is Israel. So ultimately, it is what's considered the high contracting authority to the entire territory. Whether it keeps it all or not is a whole different question, lots of practical issues. I understand that's reasonable people can debate over that. That's not in question. The question is what's legal. And the foundations people are putting forward since really the Venice Declaration in Europe in 1979, since uh, the unfortunate characterization of our policy by, by Colin Powell, by Secretary of State Colin Powell, right after 9-11, that, that we were always for a two-state solution, it simply wasn't true. The, the legal foundations had always been the mandate. We understood it as the mandate, and, and, and that was what we had to measure any international action against. The Rhodes Agreement, was consistent with the mandate. It said the borders that were established, which the thing we call now is the 67 borders, uh, were established as ceasefire lines that distinctly were said and written in the agreement not to be able to, pre were, were written so that they will not prejudice the final lines. It made it very clear these are not borders and that it would be wrong to consider them borders and more, it would be wrong to use them as a precedent for borders. So we had this strong legal foundation, even in Resolution 242, after the 67 war, the United States stood on its principles. Instead, Israel will withdraw from territories, not the territories. And there's lots of literature concurrently to that period as to why we left out the definite article. It was not an unintentional oversight. It was deliberate and specifically for the reason of making it uh, consistent with the Rhodes Agreement. So the result is, um, we had a legal foundation all the way roughly until Venice in Europe and Oslo with the United States, where it was understood Israel has, is the high contracting authority and it will make practical decisions and political decisions and self-interested and security decisions, all of which will then decide what it will eventually do with this territory. Give it all up, give part of it up, give nothing up, whatever. Suddenly, all of a sudden, you got this whole thing of withdrawal where it is wrong for Israel to hold it. It's illegal for Israel to hold it. It is illegal for Israel to settle there, even though in the mandate, there are clauses that specifically say settlement should be encouraged. Um, and, and, and the territories cannot be simply lobbed off without the approval of the Jewish agency. Um, so 
essentially we started seeing the withdrawal legally from it all. And the establishment of this idea that the 67 lines are actual borders, legal borders. Therefore, what is beyond that is occupied territory. Occupied territory is defined as territory belonging to another high contracting authority that has been confiscated from them. The high contracting authority evokes its claim to the territory to demand the application of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The problem is the high contracting authority in terms of true legal foundations is Israel, not the Palestinians. Now, three, four years ago, the Palestinians unilaterally declared themselves the high contracting authority. But, you know, this is sort of like a group of uh, jumping, ju jumping jackalopes on Jupiter declaring themselves that. They can declare themselves that. That doesn't make them that. So the bottom line is Israel had the legal foundations all along. But even the legal was being surrendered. The Israeli Supreme Court said the Fourth Geneva Convention is not applicable, but its terms will be honored, which was a uh, already a withdrawal. And then you have on and on and on, all the way to, the pre to President Obama, the December 2016 UN resolution, where essentially called it all occupied territory under the terms of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So essentially what you have now with this application of Israeli law is the civilizational reversal. Legally, it takes the 67 borders and it doesn't matter if it's one millimeter or all of the West Bank. It establishes the principle that the 67 lines are not a border and that Israel has claims, legitimate legal claims beyond the border that we, the superpower of the United States, recognize. So essentially you see the civilizational structure um, uh, reversed, you see the legal structure, and then finally you have the political narrative, which is that the Palestinians have always owned this territory they were poor, people were dispossessed in 1948. Uh, now they've been reduced to the West Bank. You always see the map that Erdogan, Palestinians put forward of Palestine in 1900, Palestine in 1947, Palestine in 1949, 67, etc. And it's this shrinking mass and, and, and you can't help but feel sorry for them until you realize that it's not at all what it is and not at all what it was. They're never, that's the wrong narrative. And the problem that Israel had with that narrative and accepting it in part was Israel was essentially saying, okay, okay, we get it. We robbed the bank, but we'll give back half the money. You know, if it's a crime, it's a crime. Half a crime is still a crime. So by giving into that narrative that it was their sovereign territory in any shape or form, or that they have a genuine historic right to it, where there are two peoples with equal claims fighting over the same piece of territory essentially negates the Israeli one. It, it, you go back to the question of 1948. If, if they have a legitimate claim, Israel can't, can't exist. If we have a legitimate claim, they can't exist unless we accept their existence. So, so again, you get to this narrative, and the narrative, unfortunately, had become that Israel really is an occupied territory. They are the legitimate ancient inheritors of the land. And okay, the Israelis, after the Holocaust, we had to give them something. So we give them the Jews, we give the Jews uh, part of Palestine. That's essentially the way President Obama framed it in the Cairo speech, that, that he reduced Israel's legitimacy as a reaction to the Holocaust, rather than a, a fundamental 2,000-year-old claim that underpins everything, including the mandate. So I want to leave it at that. Um, just, just, uh, just two very quick small points. One is, um, you know, we saw in Seattle this autonomous zone. One thing that does worry me about Israel and, and, and annexation applying Israeli law is if they move ahead with this, and I sincerely hope they do, they have to actualize it. it. You know, they have to do stuff to make it irreversible. Um, towns, cities, infrastructure, etc., to make it genuinely part of Israel. Because if not, its claims will be questioned later. Look at what's happening in East Jerusalem. People are glibly beginning to talk about surrendering East Jerusalem, even though many of those neighborhoods had already been annexed in 1967. So, Again, it has to be actualized. Um, and two, 
the idea that Israeli sovereignty is applied but can be kind of suspended, like on the Temple Mount, I think, uh, I think no nation should tolerate this within its borders, uh, not in Seattle, and, and I don't think there either because we see there is no status quo on the Temple Mount. Whatever latitude is given to this, quote, autonomous entity up there uh, under Israeli sovereignty, every day is removed from Israel. And every day, by the way, its history is erased by destruction of archaeology. So I, I think that, again, to reconnect civilizationally, legally, um, and narrative-wise, autonomous zones don't do it. So I'll leave it at that and dominated too much already. Sorry. Sarah, I think, think you may still have it on mute. Unmute. Unmute. Um, thank you so much, David. I love the way you put this in a civilizational context and the fact that we're seeing a corrosion of the moral authority of the West and all of our institutions right now. You know, where, where statues of um, Ulysses S. Grant um, and of Abraham Lincoln are tumbling. Um, at this moment, you know, there is absolutely no, no respect for any of our foundational institutions. Um, and we, you know, Israel is not immune from this at all. And we see this whole, you know, intersectionality and the intersection between academia and the fact that, you know, we, uh, in, in American institutions are, are blaming America first for um, the sins of colonialism, et cetera, and not respecting any of the great contributions of Western civilization. So going to from the very, very macro level to the behind the scenes micro level, what's going on, Alex? Why, why have the brakes been put on um, within the government of Israel, today was the day that we actually thought there would finally be some action on the ground. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, I think that uh, something that many things that David said uh, that I'd like to touch on, but one I think is very important is narrative and uh, using the word annexation versus the application of sovereignty and also looking at July 1st as D-Day uh, is, is part of a narrative that's been set up, I think, intentionally to try to make uh, Benjamin Netanyahu look bad once it was clear that July 1st would not actually be the day in which application of sovereignty would be applied. Now, July 1st was uh, the day of interest for observers because uh, the tenuous coalition agreement that was signed between Benjamin Netanyahu and his challenger, Benny Gantz, uh, who eventually joined a unity government alignment. Uh, July 1st was the date that was put in the agreement as the first date in which Netanyahu could advance the application of sovereignty. The reason this happened is because Benny Gantz was not certain that he wanted uh, sovereignty to be applied in Judea and Samaria. And at the same time, there's a mapping process which is taking place, a joint mapping process of six men, uh, three Israelis and three Americans, including uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, uh, and on the uh, Israeli and on the American side, also including uh, Ambassador uh, David Friedman and Scott Leith, who's currently in Israel right now, and, and also uh, also R.A. Lightstone, who's the assistant to Ambassador Friedman. And they engaged in a very complex mapping process. Uh, anybody that saw the press conference between uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu in January saw this map, uh, which was called the conceptual map, which more or less drew a line around where the Palestinians currently control territory. Uh, but within that map, there were 15 different enclaves, Israeli communities, uh, that are more or less surrounded by areas that could be held aside for a Palestinian state should Palestinians meet those requirements and should Israel and the Palestinians negotiate 
an arrangement, a final status arrangement in the future. So Israel's agreeing to hold land on the site for four years, which is approximately half of the Area C, which it currently controls, uh, for the possibility that there may be final status negotiations later. But within that, Israel's saying, we're not going to evacuate settlements. That's, that's no longer on the table. You know, as David alluded to, Israel evacuated the Gaza Strip, took out 21 different communities and 8,500 settlers from the Gaza Strip, and in return got something like 8,500 rockets. Uh, so in Judea and Samaria, where you have 400,000 settlers, and David, you talk about having like real facts on the ground, there are 400,000 Israelis living in Judea and Samaria in over 120 settlements. And Israel's saying, we're not evacuating settlements. It's just, it's just not, it's not proven that withdrawing and evacuating uh, settlers leads to peace. So we're not doing that. Okay, so now what do you do? Well, the U.S. Peace to Prosperity Vision basically tries to canonize the facts on the ground as they are and say, that's the end of the conflict. We draw a line around where the Palestinians are, and we draw a line around where the Jews are, and that's it. And not only that, we incentivize the Palestinians with $50 billion worth of infrastructure to make their lives easier for them to accept that the situation as it currently is, is the end of the conflict forever. Okay, so how do you determine where those borders are? Well, and especially when you have 15 different uh, Israeli enclaves that are basically surrounded by what would be Palestinian territory. And you also have Palestinian villages which are surrounded by territory that would remain in Israel's hands. So in particular, figuring out the precise delineation of those borders in the future is happening now. And uh, it's happening in a joint process between the Israeli administration and the US administration. Now, something happened between the formation of that committee and today, which is coronavirus. Uh, and coronavirus sapped the attention of both administrations. There's still both countries are dealing with the pandemic crisis. Uh, and at the same time, the ability of the Americans to travel to Israel and for the Israelis to travel to the United States to explain what they're doing has been severely limited. Uh, so the mapping process, which was supposed to be finished around July 1st, is not finished. It's almost finished, but it's not completely finished. Now, because it's not finished and because, because Israelis understood that the process is not complete, they're actually using the date as a pivot to try to suggest that Netanyahu can't get the application of sovereignty done. But if you talk to people inside the prime minister's administration, you talk to people in the U.S. administration, they both say that the mapping process is continuing full steam ahead, but it's going methodically and carefully. And, and, anybody that, and people are trying to create different narratives that the reason why Netanyahu can't get it done is because of Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi. And it's true that Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi have been wavering in their support of the application of sovereignty. Uh, however, their support for the application of so sovereignty is not a prerequisite. It is certainly preferable if the defense minister and the foreign minister support sovereignty and the coalition agreement between Netanyahu and Gantz specifically stipulates that Netanyahu can advance sovereignty. So Gantz signed on the dotted line for that. Gantz also told the president of the United States to his face in January that he supported the peace of prosperity vision. Gantz also told the electorate in the run up to the elections that he supported Israel's application of sovereignty in the strategic Jordan Valley. So now, if he's sort of wavering on those promises that he made to Netanyahu, to the American president, and to the Israeli public, it kind of just demonstrates that he may not be the loyal coalition partner that he claimed to be when he was going into the unity alignment. At the same time, there are various reports that uh, sovereignty is being held up because of Jared Kushner or because the president is waffling on it. Uh, Jared Kushner just sent his advisor, Avi Berkowitz, to Israel, together with Scott Leith, immediately after a three-day visit by Ambassador Friedman to the United States, where he met with Kushner specifically to discuss uh, the mapping process as it stands now and the application of sovereignty. And, and as I mentioned, as it seems, uh, the two administrations are working on what is a very complex and sensitive process uh, but things don't necessarily go according to plan, as everybody can see by the crises that have developed with coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Like, 
In the Middle East, nothing happens until it happens, okay? And the application of sovereignty may not 100% happen. I, I mean, any, because anything is possible. However, all indications at present are that the process is moving forward as initially outlined, and we are expecting that the prime minister will make an announcement within the next several weeks, and all indications at present are that the president of the United States will support it. Right. All right. I'm going to um, take the liberty of asking you both the first question, and this one's a tough one. Um, and that is, um, if you could believe the polls um, in the United States um, about the coming election in November, which is not that far away, it looks like there will be a blue tidal wave, a tsunami of Democrats that might take the White House and the Senate and the House. And we know, rightfully or wrongfully, that the Democratic Party has not bought into the narrative of appreciating Israel and Israel's place in the community of nations. Um, do you, are you afraid that somehow, um, if Israel does go forward to this, with this move, and we do face you know, a Democratic White House and Senate and Congress, that their one real friend of the community of nations might turn around and no longer be there for, for Israel. Well, I think that that's certainly something that the Netanyahu administration is worried about, but rather than that being a deterrent from moving forward and applying sovereignty at this time, I think that's actually a motivation for Israel to move ahead as fast as possible, get this mapping process complete and apply its sovereignty while, while it can at least get the immediate recognition from a sitting U.S. president. The window that Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu has to work with a president as friendly as Donald Trump may be open for a long time. It may be closing very quickly because, A, like you mentioned, President Trump may lose in November. But also, Prime Minister Netanyahu leads a very difficult coalition in a complex parliamentary system that can collapse at any time. I mean, the, we already mm -hmm. saw in the last year and a few months, three separate elections, and there are polls coming out in Israel every day, which, by the way, show that Prime Minister Netanyahu would score uh, a landslide victory, even much greater victory than he had in any of the previous three elections. And that's, that's important to understand. And that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi ultimately will be good and loyal soldiers through this process because they know that it could possibly be obliterated in a, in a new election. Uh, but the window for Netanyahu and Trump to work together may be open for a long time. And it may be a very, very short window. And I think that that's the reason why both administrations want to see uh, this happen as quickly as possible. Um, I, I, I second everything Alex just said. I mean, you know, the bottom line is uh, inevitability. The inevitability of, of, of something is, the only inevitability is really the inevitability of an inevitability. And that, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Anything can happen. Um, so yes, there's definitely, I, I fully agree with Alex, there's a real urgent need to accomplish what can be accomplished while it can be easily still accomplished. That said, just one thing that I, and, and this is a, another sort of withdrawal that Israel's done over the last hundred years, is what is the point of Zionism? And the point of Zionism was for the Jewish people not only to restore their nation, uh, in their in the land of Israel, but to also take control of their history again, and to become the objects of history. I mean, the, to become the 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 movers of history rather than subjects. And um, it's important for Israel to understand that while I am the first to be eager to leverage and to make sure that the United States is on board with annexation. Ultimately, Israel doesn't need the United States. Uh, I, I, we've seen this ever since 1967, 1970, with the War of Attrition, this increased Americanization of Israeli strategic thought, namely that, oh, but if the Americans don't agree, Israel can't do, whether it's Iran, whether it's preempting Syria and Egypt on the eve of the 73 war, there's been essentially a surrendering of the independence of Israel strategically. And th that, in 
it now has crossed over to the peace process issues too, and territorial issues that, oh, but Israel can't do without the approval. Um, nobody asked any superpower between 1949 and 1967 when Israel applied its law to the territories it captured beyond the 48 uh, partition lines because it was understood that was its land. Uh, and and, and that, that that's just what it is. I think it's very important for Israel to understand if the elections do not go the way they should go uh, for, in terms of annexation and being pro-Israeli uh, in November, uh, Israel shouldn't accept a withdrawal from the solemn agreement the United States makes right now. First of all, Governments can't just walk away from their agreements like that, especially bilateral agreements where one side concedes something to get the agreement. And in Israel's case, they're conceding the idea of a two-state solution and stuff like that. And the legitimacy of the Palestinians still is an interlocutor. So Israel's given something. And if the, it, 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 it has to remind the United States, you can't just walk away from that. Um, but more importantly, I think Israel must remember that ultimately it is its own master and it determines its fate. The Jewish people who have been in this land for, for since, since Abraham for you know, 3,800 years do not need the UN, the United States or anybody else to tell them, well, yeah, it is your land. It is anyway. So it's important to get that, practically speaking. It's critical to get that. But again, I think Israel needs to be more confident, display the confidence, and I think the respect for Israel and the acceptance of it will follow. Very good. All right. Um, okay, we should open up the floor to questions now. Our wonderful summer intern, our intern, uh, Alana Margulies, will be reading the questions. Thank you, Alana. Okay, great. So the first question is, um, if Netanyahu feels that he won't get the necessary support in parliament or the government for extending sovereignty, um, what are the chances he'll call for snap elections? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, in the current counting that Netanyahu does in fact have a majority for the application of sovereignty in the Knesset, it's very important to understand, even if the blue and white doesn't support it, as a member of the governing coalition, which they should because their coalition agreement basically commits them to supporting that. Uh, but even without them, it does seem that there is a, a majority in the Knesset for that. Also, uh, by law, Israel can, can similarly take the decision to the uh, cabinet as opposed to the Knesset. And even in the cabinet, uh, which does have an outsized representation by blue and white as part of the agreement that was signed with Netanyahu, uh, even within the cabinet, uh, Netanyahu should still have a majority to apply sovereignty. So. Um, that, that is something that, that's good. Uh, it's definitely, it uh, th doesn't seem like it's the overwhelming majority uh, that seemed to be in place for recognition of sovereignty before the elections, but I think that that has more to do with just political posturing uh, ahead of what may be a snap election. At the same time, uh, Israel can go ahead uh, and apply sovereignty, and there's a looming budget battle uh, which is taking place now also uh, inside the coalition. And if a budget agreement is not passed, uh, that would automatically kick in yet another election cycle. So Netanyahu, if he wants elections, he could still pass sovereignty, uh, which would probably only boost his popularity in the country as he promised uh, the application of sovereignty in the run-up to the elections, and then still crash the government over the budget and go into an election and possibly uh, win in a landslide in which he doesn't need Benny Gantz uh, to form a new government and he could sit in power for the next four years. Lana? Okay, um, the next question is, will extending sovereignty have any effect on the process or the outcome of the ICC, the International Criminal Court case against Israel right now? Uh, sh should I, or Alex, do you want to try? Go ahead, David, go ahead. Uh, no, because I think the process is cooked. I mean, Israel could give up every inch and it'll still, it doesn't matter. This is not an objective process based on facts. It is a 
I mean, I'll go as far as to say it is an anti-Semitic attack. And you can't negotiate compromise or come to some sort of an understanding with an anti-Semitic attack. This has nothing to do with reality. The ICC <clears throat> assault on Israel here has nothing to do with Israel's behavior or the reality on the ground. Um, it has to do with who is currently running it, this lady, uh, Ben Sudo. So, you know, it, it really, I don't think it has any impact um, at all. And at the end of the day, not, the United States is not part of the ICC anyway. So, no, I don't see it. A, a court that rules against the legal foundations of a situation is just discrediting itself. Lana? Okay, great. Um, so the next question is about the status of Palestinians um, should um, extension of sovereignty happen. So the question is, uh, will Palestinians become Israeli citizens or where, will there be a pathway to citizenship? And if not, what their legal status would be? So at present, uh, Palestinians won't be included uh, as Israeli citizens. I mean, the whole point of uh, the plan as it's, as it's being presented right now is to keep Israelis in Israel and to keep Palestinians on the side as part of a, uh, as part of a Palestinian entity. There is discussion uh, within the Jordan Valley in which there are much smaller Palestinian communities uh, that would be completely surrounded. The possibility of offering them either residency or pathway to citizenship uh, similar to uh, East Jerusalem residents, for example, uh, many of which have, all of which have Palestinian, uh, Israeli residency rather, uh, some of which have applied for, for Israeli citizenship. Uh, but that is a very, very small percentage of the, of the Palestinian population. Yes. Um, Lani? Um, okay, I'll try to speak closer to the microphone. Um, so uh, why did Netanyahu pick July 1st as the day to, as the first day for him to apply sovereignty and what is its significance? Why not wait until after the summer? Right, I think that that was the date in which the U.S. and the Israeli teams felt that the mapping process could be finished at the earliest. So the idea was that that would be the first day in which Netanyahu could bring it uh, to the, either the cabinet or the Knesset for a vote. And that was basically to allay Benny Gantz's fears that uh, Netanyahu would work on the diplomatic issue of sovereignty as opposed to uh, girding the country against the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you know, so it was just to put priorities first and second. But, but there's no holy grail of July 1st. Um, but now, as, as I've just written it will be published later, I, Israel's on the clock. Uh, to, to apply sovereignty. It's not that this was the deadline, this is the, this is the beginning. So I do think that the real window closes, uh, you know, before November, because really we want this to happen uh, with a sitting president and not with a lame duck president in case the president loses in November. They want this to happen before then. Um, and really the sooner the better. And specifically with uh, all the all the noise around the world dealing with coronavirus and, and all the other issues now might actually be a perfect time to do this because it's it's obvious that uh, the opponents of such a move are going to be vocal they've already been vocal but the news cycle today is moving very quickly and there are numerous much more important issues to worry about aside from whether israel applies its sovereignty over land it already controls i mean the whole idea of annexation as a concept is being thrown out as part of, of a narrative warfare, as, as David uh, was talking about the narratives, to sort of symbolize uh, or to suggest that Israel is going to be marching over a line where it hasn't already marched or hanging a flag in a place where it hasn't already hung. Uh, there's 400,000 people living there. Israel's not going to deploy a single soldier or tank in order to affect this application of sovereignty. In fact, for all the Palestinians and all the Israelis that live on the ground, they're not even going to notice the change. There's going to be zero change on the ground, not even the hanging of a sign. Uh, you know, so hopefully if this does take place soon, while the world is distracted with a lot of more important issues, uh, it will move out of the news cycle more quickly. Lana? Um, okay, we only have time um, for one or two more questions, um, but the next question is, uh, says that 
Um, there are threats from Lebanon and Gaza that uh, should Israel extend sovereignty, they will attack Israel. How likely is this to happen? And can Israel handle um, two fronts uh, with riots in the West Bank and also from Lebanon? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, first of all, can Israel handle it? Israel could easily handle it. it, it it's all a question of strategy and, uh, and its will to act. Uh, even 2006, uh, uh, in, in, in Lebanon in 2014, uh, the messiness, the indecisiveness, et cetera, was all a question of Israeli choices. It wasn't a question of the real power that Israel has. Uh, and I'd assume that with Hezbollah in Lebanon, they, they, won't, they won't let it sort of fester. And I think with this new chief of staff, he's not so new anymore, Kochavi, he has a tendency to focus much more on uh, decisive outcome and decisive uh, tactics and battle and strategy uh, than any before. And I think it's a, a welcome change in the IDF. Uh, as far as will they do it, there's a phrase in Hebrew uh, from a comic strip, uh, not comic strip, but comic play uh, called It's hold me back so I don't hit the guy. Um, I think what's happening is that, that Hezbollah the, the, the PA uh, and Hamas all have their reasons for saying that they're going to do something. But the problem is they're going to throw the party and nobody's going to show up and they know it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a real issue here. I think, by the way, the Palestinian Authority today uh, imposed a full shutdown, lockdown because of Corona, which is, which is uh, obviously because of Corona, but it also serves that secondary purpose of making an excuse for people not showing up to riot. And, to, and so forth. So I think, I think that, that there really is a, uh, 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 a lot of noise, but it won't happen. The only one I'm worried about is Jordan, but that's a whole different question. And I'm not sure that necessarily needs to be. Uh, I just want to add that I think a very important precedent uh, happened in uh, May 2018 when the uh, U.S. moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and there was all kind of threats about the beginnings of intifadas, and there was some rioting along the Gaza border, as everybody uh, cynically remembers, them showing pictures of the embassy on the one hand and the Gaza border on the other, but those Gaza riots were going on a weekly basis for months already, and in fact dissipated soon after uh, the embassy was moved, and there was not a single riot that took place, uh, and, and there are thousands of Israelis, I, I, I just live actually, you know, just a few hundred meters from the embassy and I'm looking out my window at, at 100,000 Palestinians living in Jerusalem and there was no riots over here. So um, there's definitely a lot of threats and, and, and bluster as David references, but, uh, and you can't rule out at any time uh, a, a rush towards violence because Palestinians have been incited from the times there were children. Uh, really to commit acts of violence against against Israelis. And now that's being done on social media and on television and other means. So you cannot rule out uh, terror attacks, but there doesn't really seem to be uh, too many indications that there's going to be mass rioting here. Okay. Um, there's one last question I'd like to um, ask the panelists from Mindy Stein, who said she just read that the American administration is seeking that Israel make a gesture towards the Palestinians to offset the application of Israeli law. Um, is that true as far as you know? And if so, what is that gesture and what is that compensation to the Palestinians? Well, I haven't heard about anything specific at present. However, Israel is making a tremendous gesture, which is holding on building in over 50% of the area C in which it controls for four years. There's going to be a four year building freeze in half the land that Israel controls in Judea and Samaria in the odd chance that the Palestinians meet uh, the basic requirements that the United States has laid out for statehood, which includes uh, the the ceasing of all terror incitement, the stopping of the pay to slay terror financing campaign where the Palestinian Authority pays to uh, terrorists and to families of martyrs and to completely demilitarize. There's no real reason for Israel to, to do that. I mean, Israel controls Area C. Nobody tells the Palestinians where they can and can't build in areas A and B where they control. And Israel can build wherever it wants in Area C. But Israel is taking 
uh, taking a commitment not to build in 50% of that area in order to save it in the odd off chance that the Palestinians will meet those requirements. So that's a significant gesture, I believe. Okay. Um, I think we do have time for um, one more question, which, um, and it's, uh, I kind of know the answer to this, but I'd love to see you have um, you both respond to this. How will the um, Arab Gulf states and the other um, Arab states respond to this? Yeah, um, just, just one quick thing on the last question. Um, you know, uh, in Arabic, there's no real word for goodwill gesture. <laughs> in Hebrew, there's no real word for common sense. And I think that, <laughs> that explains a lot right there. Um, <laughs> Uh, about the other Arab states, uh, you know, I mentioned Jordan. Jordan is, quote, a friendly Arab state, uh, although I think, I think uh, King Abdullah has made some very grave and serious strategic mistakes in how he defines his kingdom over the last 10 years. And I, and I think that he has to make a fundamental choice uh, as to where he lands ultimately. I think when you look at the rest of the Arab states with whom at least the United States has good relations, whether it's Egypt or whether it's the UAE or Saudi Arabia or whatever. I think uh, we didn't get into it, but it's a major part of this whole uh, deal of the century. Uh, they may huff and puff and say this and that about, oh, they don't like Israeli sovereignty here and there, but they are for this plan and they are for this plan because it does one simple thing. It puts to rest the Palestinian issue for them. It ends it. They are washing their hands of this through this plan because they want to move on. They need to move on. So I don't think anything that uh, a goodwill gesture or anything else changes that fundamental dynamic. There's a, there are bigger fish to fry in the Muslim world, whether it's Sunni Shiite, whether it's Erdogan versus the Egyptians and Saudis. They are entering a period of, I, I, honestly, I, I think they're entering a period of, of tremendous chaos, breakdown, state collapse, and all sorts of civilizational agony over the next century, half century. They don't have time anymore to deal with the Israeli problem. And then the second thing is, I think what you'll see emerging in the wake of this chaos are older civilizations like Persia which naturally have a much greater uh, interest in aligning with Israel than, uh, than confronting it. So um, I, I think that ultimately they've given up and this is their vehicle to do so. Yeah, I, I think that I, I couldn't agree with what you're saying anymore. The, the only thing I would add is that uh, this move is not taking the Arab states by surprise. I mean, Jared Kushner presented the first part of the peace, greater peace vision in Bahrain uh, way before the press conference between Netanyahu and Trump uh, in Washington in January. So there's been a lot of discussions about what this actually looks like with Arab leaders. I mean, the specifics of the maps still you know, are waiting to be presented, but the, the concept has been presented to them you know, already for a long time. And, and David, as you mentioned, all these countries, as we're seeing with Bahrain, the United Arab, Arab, Arab Emirates, and specifically Jordan and Egypt, they all understand that it's in their best interest to be allied with Israel on some level much more than to be antagonistic. The gains that Israel can give their nations is much better than any gains that they can have from aligning uh, with the Palestinians at the expense of alliances with Israel. Excellent. Um, I just would like to end up by saying um, David Wormser is a phenomenal representative of the Center for Security Policy, which is a wonderful think tank um, that we've worked closely with for many, many years. And um, Alex Trayman is the Jerusalem Bureau Ch Chief of JNS.org. Both of these are wonderful institutions. Um, if you would like to support them, please go onto their websites and um, do that. I also was told by my board that I really have got to um, tell people that um, Amet really needs your support. This is our 20th um, webinar. All of these are done as a public service to inform the community. Um, we are a small think tank, but we punch way above our weight. And we do have salaries to pay and rent to pay, and um, we can use any support as well. Um, so please, if you'd like to go onto our website at amidonline.org, 
um, we would appreciate any, any shekels or dollars that you could send our way. Thank you so much. And um, David and Alex, I cannot thank either of you enough for your brilliance. Thank you. Thank you. Onward and upward. Thanks. Signing out now. Bye-bye.